much as you can showcase what you do in relating it to impact would also help us moving others into this direction. <coughs> I know it's a broad question, we probably would need a one day seminar to <laughs> really uh, dig into the topic, uh, but given our time constraints, if you could give us a sort of sense of where you are, sort of state of the art, and you believe you are 20% of where you should be, 80%, 50%, uh, if uh, the goal is 100% to this for five years or 10 years from now, so just sense of that. Let me say, first of all, we devote three percent <coughs> of our project budget to um, basically monitoring, evaluation, and impact assessment. So 3% of all our funds are put into that effort. Um, <coughs> we've got a full monitoring, evaluation, and learning strategy, which we'd be very happy to share with you, DG. Um, and we're just reviewing that at the moment. But let me give you a sense of what we try to do. We've got a portfolio now of about 200 projects. It's, it's a big portfolio with our partners. So what we've developed is a management information system, which has all of the baseline data and then how we plan to look at the, the impact of what we do for each project. So that one of the things that we're very keen to do is to set up very clear theories of change for what we're trying to do. So say for example, if we're working with a custom system, the implementation should reduce clearance times, increase trade, etc. So we, we have theories of change for each of our different projects and results benchmarks. And we put this MIS into operation where all our teams are now putting that data in. Um, it's quite a challenge for us. We, we kicked it off back in, um, I think, uh, just this month. and. It'll be fully up and running, we hope, by July. Okay, and uh, basically what we're going to do is we're going to allow our partners to have access to that real time. So you, you can actually come, go online, DG, I hope, later on in the year, and you can actually check, check the kind of results that we're achieving. We've also, um, Donna's been doing some really good thinking around how we do the impact evaluation, because as you said, there are attribution issues, etc. And I think that we could talk all day, because it's, it's the... Um, it's a complex area. I'll ask Donna just to talk for a couple of minutes um, to supplement what I've said. But I reckon, you see, one of the things we've tried to do is take a very pragmatic approach. With 200 projects, um, it is a real challenge to get all, all the M&E systems in place. And what we've tried to do is really target the main interventions with what I would call a kind of gold standard. Okay, And we've adopted, so in other words, that's very, very rigorous, and the smaller interventions um, we've tried to do in a simpler way. Okay. And we've adopted this, this donor standard on enterprise development um, in the work that we do. And how, how much are local stakeholders, uh, governments, uh, business, uh, civil society, how much are they involved in uh, the determination of these uh, parameters, uh, benchmarks? Uh, I mean, is it something that they own? Hence, you know, creating a sort of ground pressure uh, to better uh, proportionate uh, resources to the achievement of these uh, outcomes? Or is it something which is more sort of corporate uh, top down and which you know they just have to uh, accept uh, because this is what uh, the sort of leadership and uh, sponsors of, uh, of <coughs> East Africa have decided? We're trying to find a balance between the top down bottom up sort of approach. At a project level, we've been working very closely with partners to try and develop. Um, a results chain for the programs for the, their particular project. So that's really sort of the articulation of what are they doing, the outputs, and how is that supposed to um, bring about the changes that are sort of desired. And that's been a really useful process with partners and really get, getting the thinking out on the table and clarifying for them and us sort of what the project's about. And using that as the first step to um, then develop the monitoring plan. But there's certainly we, we do have partners, if I can mention, the Uganda Revenue Authority is very, um, very interested in this area 
and we've um, been talking with them and even sharing our lessons about setting up monitoring and evaluation um, systems. Hand over to you our partners. So, yes, could I first hand over to Goodsell? As it was starting, Rwanda and Burundi joined in 2007. Already there's a lot of uh, interest and uh, Sudan and Somalia is also uh, asking to join. Uh, and uh, while the treaty provides that uh, the path that uh, the community is followed was the part of Castle Shinu, uh, which started in 2005, and uh, we have moved to common market. Right now we are negotiating the monetary union, and uh, it is hoped that uh, finally uh, we will move uh, to the political sector. This is uh, some uh, dream of, of, the, of this region. Well, perhaps um, if I could now hand it over to, um, to our private sector partners, and maybe Andrew, can I call on you, sir, from the East African Business Council? Great to have you here. No doubt, but right now, the apex board of the private sector in the region is EABC. We are recognized by the policy makers within the EAC of our structures of policy process. So, and um, the, other sec the, the, the other issue is that the establishment of thematic platforms to address particular issues. As uh, mentioned by Lisa, these platforms have brought together these particular sectors, women in business, professional service providers, employers, and standards, as well as tourism. Consensus building, particularly by pertaining to these sectors, is one of the issues which has been attained in this whole process. So they address their issues, we, are teaching, we, we push them through the EABC process, out after the Secretary General, then they go to the policy makers or the sector councils. The other issue is the SG Forum. This is a platform which has got the condition of consensus building within the private sector. Two years back, there was no consensus building within East Africa, the private sector. But right now, the issues we are treated in the regional forum, they are presented at the summit, and I've got information that the next Council of Ministers, the Sector Council of Trade, this report is part of the background document. The, the senior officials are going to address these particular issues. I think, uh, Franklin, just in summary, is that the support we have got from Trademark East Africa is that EABC is now able to get consensus within the private sector we push our issues to the, the policy making process and integration without any question that this is not a position of the private sector. This morning, the private sector is presenting the review of the CET in the Minister of Pre Budget Minister of Finance meeting. The first time since 2008, the private sector is presenting a, 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 a built position with no question. It's worth now moving across the region and um, Adam, could I call on you from the Tanzania Chamber? May I just congratulate you for winning the International Prize for Innovation, uh, Chamber's Innovation. I think you, but you, we jointly won that just recently. So congratulations. With, uh, let me tell you that the Tanzania Chamber of Commerce uh, is, is essentially an advocacy and lobby uh, association uh, striving to create a conducive business environment for everybody local, uh, regional, or international people are doing business in Tanzania. Um, after the introduction of the EAC Customs Union, we have seen an increase in uh, cross-border trade. And many of our members and uh, business people in Tanzania trying to do business across the borders faced a lot of challenges in the form of uh, non-tariff barriers. And uh, Within the EAC, we have a mechanism for uh, reporting and eliminating NTBs. Uh, locally, we have what we call the National Monitoring Committee, for which the Tanzania Chamber of Commerce is a focal point, and uh, the Minister of Industries and East Africa, as, of course. And uh, we have at the EAC level what we call the NTB Elimination Forum, uh, where all officials meet and uh, the advantage mostly is being supported by TMEA 
And the advantage we get in that forum is uh, we create rapport among the officials within the EAC. So when it comes to solving these NTBs, sometimes it's not necessary to report them and then uh, discuss them. We simply make a phone call across, you know who is in charge in Uganda, you know who is in charge in uh, Rwanda, and sometimes it's not a real issue, but it's a very simple issue. But that requires communication uh, from the border to Dar es Salaam, for instance, in Tanzania, where you, you have this uh, link, the customs, the upgrade of the customs system, and that is uh, uh, a scooter world. We had the problem with the, 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 the current, the previous system. Uh, it was not web-based. It was not uh, easy to extend and integrate. It did not have a single window platform, and it had uh, challenges with compliance. Great, that system, which will give us enormous benefits. First of all, it will enable integration with other systems. It will enable uh, us to, to customize it to our requirements, and uh, we, are, we are very excited about it. We started the pilot uh, in November last year, and uh, now we are rolling it out to the different stations in the country. Can, can I go over now to you, um, sir, Deputy Commissioner General from the OBR in uh, Burundi? Some of them are trade facilitation. Uh, Trademark East Africa provides assistance in many projects related to trade facilitation, such, such as construction of OSPP uh, at uh, Kobero Kabanga between Tanzania and Burundi, a survey of all borders, border posts, facilitate meetings of the border post technical committee, electrification of Kobero, uh, the area of business applications, trademark East Africa facilitated the acquisition of domestic integrated tax system, the acquisition of the Asikuda ward and the ERP integrated back office operations. IT equipment, Trademark East Africa, has procured and continue to do so necessary <coughs> IT tools such as computers, laptops, proctors, printers, and so on. Maybe if I could hand it back over to the private sector. We were implementing on, we, it was in three components. One was on um, addressing the bottlenecks for, from, you know, the bottlenecks that are being experienced from the, uh, at the port of Mombasa and the way bridges. That is in terms of trade facilitation and trade logistics. The, you know, as various speakers have said, you know, the port of Mombasa from the private sector perspective is a serious challenge in terms of doing business. And Trademark East Africa has supported KEPSA in addressing bottlenecks in the port of Mombasa and the way bridges. The second one was on the policy bottlenecks that Kenya, pri uh, the private sector or the business community in Kenya that experiences in regard to doing business within East Africa. John, can I hand over to you good self? Over time you realize that whereas we in the business sector are always complaining about trade facilitation, about non tariff barriers, some of the challenges that make business not happen in this region are actually founded within the private sector. Therefore, we realized that we needed to take a deliberate effort to, to improve our side of the bargain through training our people, through enhancing professionalism, through inculcating ethics and integrity. Now, what we have done is that we partnered with the revenue authorities, all the five revenue authorities of East Africa, and we developed a practitioner's course, training program, a six months course, and each and every clearing agent is expected to go through that training course, then pass an exam, and after that you get a practicing certificate. Our understanding with the revenue authorities is that, is that once we have trained a, a critical mass, and that is by the end of this year, only those, those people who will have been trained will be licensed as customs agents by the revenue authorities. I'm you know, really excited about this work um, that we're doing with you, I must say, and I, I'm, I'm quite tempted to go on the course just for fun as well, but thank you very much. Okay, um, I, I'd like to maybe hand it back to government now, and um, I'd like to hand over to, to our delegate from South Sudan. Trademark has been with us almost now two years, 
and he's great he's doing a very remarkable works, especially in Numuli Bordel. Uh, he's helping and he's now constructing uh, one uh, stop post in, 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 in Numuli, which is going to share between us and, 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 and Uganda. And, and, and that one is helping a lot of uh, trade facilitation nowadays, especially uh, when we when they we are in when they we joined what we call when they set up uh, scooters, we will be able to, to, to share information very easily between between the uh, Uganda and South Sudan. Over time, we have had the support from Trademark in terms of some logistical support, some kind of computers. Uh, Photocopiers and so on and so forth. But more importantly, we have received support in the areas of training the <coughs> officers in these ministries, along with some key stakeholders in key issues like uh, team building, policy formulation, planning, and also in the area, in the same area of capacity building, we have uh, had support to come up with the development plans for these uh, ministries or sectors. Now, Trade Park particularly has been a key partner in this issue of Trade Park facilitation, as has already been presented. Quite a lot of money has been planned for the Port of Mombasa. The ones to call the post, they have been very good allies, and I think they're making uh, great progress. So in terms of the area of trade facilitation, Trademark has come really very strong, and I think that is their key area of support in Kenya and also in the region. The good news for you is that there's one bit of this agenda which may stand on its own feet without waiting for the rest of the package to be agreed, which is the trade facilitation agreement, uh, which was not such a big issue in 01, but given the transformation in international trade, and notably the expansion of these uh, global supply chain, has become a major problem uh, because uh, thickness of border was an issue when you had to cross one border to trade, now you have on average uh, three, four, five borders to cross to trade. The thickness of borders have become five times more of an obstacle to trade than 10 years ago. Hence the pressure to streamline, harmonize, uh, uh, shrink this administrative thickness. And this, if that would if that would happen, it would have a major impact on international trade. Now the, the average cost of moving trade through borders today worldwide is 10% of the value of trade. The average trade weighted tariff worldwide is 5% today. So moving trade through a border outside from the tariff is twice as costly as paying for the tariff. If we were to succeed in shrinking this 10% by half, it would have an equivalent on world trade of zeroing all tariffs in all countries of this planet. So, which is one of the reasons why it's now top of the agenda. Of course, it's a complex issue because it's basically a customs negotiation handled by trade people. And as you know, you're well placed to know that the relationship between the front office of trade and the back office of customs is not always uh, simple. But that's, that's something which could unfold relatively rapidly, <coughs> which of course would have a major impact on helping your countries, because it would create a worldwide benchmark and then moving to this benchmark would be just a question of time, but it would create a sort of you know, leveled objective. It being understood that US, EU, Japan would have to comply by day one, and that countries like Kenya or East African uh, countries would have a staged process in order to join 
for instance, there is a lot of negotiation of, on a single window system, which you are already practicing or moving to reality in your region. So these are areas which could be harvested by countries like yours. And then, of course, it creates a big snowball effect because the pressure on others <coughs> to move in the same direction becomes bigger and bigger as countries join to this sort of benchmark. Now, just maybe I will mention one thing, uh, Frank. In preparation for the fourth global review that will be uh, uh, held in Geneva uh, in uh, July, we have disseminated a number of questionnaires to enterprises. <coughs> And more than 700 enterprises responded. And I have to say that when we summarized, the question was basically, what are the constraints preventing you from connecting to global value chains or regional value chains? What are the constraints you are really faced with? What are the constraints or to global uh, 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 corporates, what are the constraints preventing you from expanding your supply network into some of the lower income countries. And the responses we got from all of them, if I have to summarize them, <coughs> speak exactly to where a trademark East Africa and all of you have decided to focus. Um, Ambassador Johan Borgstam, sir, could, would you like to make the, the closing remarks? Protocols on sir, uh, I would like to start my my remarks with, with a tiny breach of protocol because before uh, thanking the DG and the deputy DG, I would really like to thank Frank and through him the team at Trademark East Africa for having brought us together, but above all for the very good work that they are achieving together with you. And I think we have all throughout this session been terribly, terribly impressed by the time management skills of Frank. Also to, to thank the DG and the, the deputy DG and their team for, for being with us in here today and to thank them all on behalf, I believe, of uh, all of us, uh, investors, uh, stakeholders and so on uh, and so forth. Because by, by your presence you show, you symbolize the importance of uh, what uh, Frank and his team together with you have been uh, achieving. And it's also a recognition of what you have uh, achieved uh, together.